It's really great to have, um, have Jonathan Weissman here this evening as a veteran journalist. Uh, Jonathan has covered a wide range of topics uh, for, for the best newspapers in the country. Uh, indeed, during his career, he's, he's worked for, for five of the best so far, um, including the Baltimore Sun, USA Today, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, and last but certainly not least, the New York Times, uh, where he's currently the uh, deputy Washington editor. Uh, in the process, Jonathan has covered some of Washington's toughest beats, including Congress uh, and the White House, uh, and he's written on a broad array of subjects, from national politics and military affairs to economic policy and, and social issues. Uh, three years ago, he also published a, a well-received first novel, Number Four, Imperial Lane. Uh, as his colleagues will tell you, Jonathan is, a, is an energetic, enterprising reporter uh, and um, in increasingly uh, experienced editor uh, with a knack for explaining uh, complex matters. Uh, but nothing had quite uh, prepared him for what he encountered during the last presidential campaign when, uh, in response to a rather innocuous tweet, he became the target of what grew into a vicious torrent of anti-Semitic attacks. Of course, anti-Semitism isn't new in the United States, but it has become more pronounced with the election of Donald Trump. In his new book, Semitism, uh, in triple parentheses, which Jonathan will explain uh, the significance of that in a minute, uh, Semitism being Jewish in America in the age of Trump, uh, Jonathan explores the recent activities of hate groups and their leaders. He argues for standing up to this resurgent bigotry and recommends ways of taking collective action. Kirk has called the book, quote, an urgent and compelling report on the clear and present danger of proto-fascism in the U.S. And Publishers Weekly praised the work as a uh, chilling and uh, thoughtful and deeply personal account. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Wiseman. Brad and I actually overlapped at the at the Washington Post. We covered the Iraq War together. Well, that was a lot of fun. Um, that was only 15 years ago, Brad. <laughs> Can you believe that? Uh, so, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Weissman. I assume you guys know that. Uh, I actually know a lot of you, and you made your way here. But I tell you my name because it has more meaning to me now. It's Jewish. For, for most of my life, I didn't really think about that very much, that I had a Jewish name. I grew up in a uh, Jewish but moderately Jewish household in Atlanta. I, I had a very reformed synagogue. I was bar mitzvahed but without the encumbrance of a Haftorah portion. Um, I actually thought it was normal that we had an electric arc uh, that, that went down, the lights went on, and we had a, a Christian choir actually behind uh, curtains so they would sound more and more angelic. Um, and it, I really, that really wasn't. So when I, and I went off to college in Chicago and I really didn't have much to do with uh, Judaism at all uh, except for an argument my senior year with the rabbi uh, at Hillel over whether Israel should embrace the two-state solution or the Canton solution. But I'm not going to get into that because, as I say in my book uh, over and over, we talk about Israel way too much here. Um, I did insist that my children uh, would be raised Jewish when I got married way too young to my uh, college girlfriend. Um, she was, as you might have guessed, not Jewish. Uh, she was the daughter of a lapsed Catholic turned Pentecostalist, but she still agreed that she would raise the children Jewish. Um, and then when they finally came along, they're actually sitting back there, um, like 12 years later, uh, my wife didn't want to raise them Jewish because she felt like, you know, raising, having Jewish, having a Jewish husband and Jewish children would make her, her feel like a stranger in her own house. And I didn't want to hold her to a promise that she had made when she was basically a child. Um, so they so they weren't raised Jewish. And I, I'm not saying that out of any particular pride. In fact, I say it with some, tr some embarrassment. Uh, but what I mean is I was a pretty typical Jew of my generation, which means not very Jewish, until I was. And it was because of my name, Jonathan Weissman. 
In May of 2016, Donald Trump was marauding through the Republican primaries. The uh, Republican elite in Washington thought that he somehow wouldn't win the uh, win the nomination. There was some kind of deus ex machina that would sweep swoop down and stop him, but we never really figured out what that would be. Um, Robert Kagan, who's at the Brookings Institution and writes a column for uh, the Washington Post, wrote a column called This is How Fascism Comes to America. And as I do often, I took a, a, a good little quip from it. I put it online. I sent it out in a Twitter. I didn't think much of it. And then I got something back from somebody calling himself Cyber Trump. Cyber Trump just said, hello, Weissman. And Weissman was in three parentheses. I did know that my name was Jewish. I kind of intuited that this had something to do with that. So I said, care to explain? And he said, what ho the vaunted Ashkenazi intelligence? Ha, ha, ha. It's a, it's a dog whistle fool. I have belled the cat for my fellow Goyim. And then this onslaught came on me. I mean, let me explain what belling the cat meant, which I only learned later. Unbeknownst to me, a very clever, uh, enterprising member of the alt-right, uh, that proto, that fascist group of agglomeration of racist, anti-Semites, white nationalists, uh, generally aggrieved human beings, uh, had created a piece of software um, called a Google plugin that you could just pull off of Google, uh, and it, it had, the, had the very bland name of coincidence indicator, so that did not raise any suspicions at Google. But if you got the coincidence indicator, you could actually search for punctuation marks, three parentheses. So I didn't realize this, but actually you can't, in Google searches, look for punctuation marks. Uh, you, need, you need special software. So if you get the coincidence indicator and somebody in the alt-right, say Andrew Anglin, who is the particularly malicious editor of the Daily Stormer, um, decides to mark you uh, with, with the, what they call the echoes, then his minions can swarm. And they did swarm. I was certainly not the only Jewish journalist who was swarmed on. There were many. Um, I was, they, actually, the Anti-Defamation League kept a tally, and eventually uh, I came in number five in the top ten. So, um, but uh, I, I just I want to give you some view of what they look like. And I, I actually went on Twitter just a couple of weeks ago to pull some of the images down, and Twitter has actually purged most of them, but you'll, you'll get some idea. So this is what I'm talking about. It... This is what they put out, this is one of their memes. It puts the gold star on the chest, or it gets the hose again. It, meaning the, the echoes, puts the gold star on her chest, and the hose, meaning the gas chamber. Uh, this is from one of my friends, Daryl Lampshade. Uh, quick question, why have Jews been kicked out of so many countries if they have never done anything wrong? Please answer. This was a recurring theme uh, Jews are made to answer for their own oppression uh, because somehow we asked for it. This next one, Ari Goldberg, uh, is I included because Ari Goldberg is not the name of whoever put that together. Twitter, unlike Facebook, allows you to adopt any name you want. Um, and so you can choose a Jewish name and uh, be an anti-Semite. And this little character, the sniveling Jewish uh, caricature, caricature there. There's a whole story I go into him in my book about who that guy is. Um, but it, it kind of he he kind of illustrates the no-win situation that Jews ha are in in the alt right because we're both like the sniveling, conniving, weakling, and we're also all powerful. So uh, you can't really tell. Oyve, he's grabbing the shekels from the poor little goyim. Trump is not as good as Jews at stealing them. This is another journalist named Julia Yaffe. Julia Yaffe was a, uh, is, works for The Atlantic. At that time, she was a freelance journalist, uh, and she did, a, she did a, a, a nice profile of Melania Trump went, going back to her Croatian days, and Melania did not like this profile. So once Melania decided that she didn't like it, the alt-right Nazis all attacked Julia Yaffe. Here's a picture of Julia being shot in the head by a Nazi. Um, when Melania was confronted by the response of uh, 
these supporters. She said she, Julia Yaffe, had provoked it. Um, this is another one of their memes. This is a, uh, I can't remember what, which journalist that is. I was in this too. Basically, they would just take, take a journalist, put her in the gas chamber, and have Donald Trump throw the switch. And here's, a, I won't read you this. It's too gross. But I will tell you, this picture of Daniel Day-Lewis is not to indicate that Daniel Day-Lewis is an alt-right Nazi. It is that Daniel Day-Lewis uh, was in a, a movie, a uh, big, big Martin Scorsese epic called The Gangs of New York, in which he played a character named Bill the Butcher, who was a nativist, and therefore he's uh, a hero of the alt-right. It's an odd movie. Um, haven't Jews been kicked out of enough ne from, all, from all nations? It will be your turn next. This is another uh, theme that the, uh, the white nationalists like to pick on. In fact, you know, in, in uh, Europe, there's a, the brand of kind of left-wing anti-Semitism is born of anti-Zionism. In the, in, in the United States, the alt-right form of anti-Semitism is actually pro kind of pro-Zionist. They like Israel. They think of Israel as a homeland for the Jews where all American Jews should go. Um, they actually think that uh, Israel is, is something of a model um, because they want a white homeland and they see uh, Israel as a Jewish homeland if we would all just go there. Uh, this is this one, the, the, you, is it, I, Winter Chan, that's... Don't worry about that. But see the, the, how the echoes go the other way? That's to signify that he's on the right side. And uh, they love to trigger people That's to, to get a rise out of them. Um, there's no business like show a business. Here's a, a, a recurring image of the all-powerful Jew uh, crushing the masses. And um, this is one of those things where if you actually rise to your own defense and say, I oppose anti-Semitism, they say, ha, you're, they, they try to grab the, the cause of free speech and say, you are imposing, infringing on our free speech, you special snowflake, which is another term that they love. Um, here's a quote from Goebbels. I don't know why I have it here, because I won't even quote Goebbels, but uh, it does make the point. And this is one of their, uh, their paranoid imagery. The Goyim no, shut it down. They have this notion that the uh, that the Jews have this all powerful plot to control the world, and if the goyim uh, ever find out about it, we'll have to shut the whole thing down. And this goes back to this notion that uh, we all should be leaving this country to the white nationalists. This is a uh, uh, Jews aren't white uh, according to alt, the alt right, and we need to go back to Israel. So. Just to give you an idea, there were other, so many other pictures, I can't even imagine how many. Uh, and people often ask me if I was scared, if I had gone to the police, if I was okay. And really, I was okay. Uh, I really, I, maybe I was foolish, but I really wasn't scared of these two-bit cyber terrorist Nazis. I am now. Now I am, because since writing, since I began writing the book about my experiences, Things have changed. A follower of the Alt Reich came upon a young black man, a young black student um, at the University of Maryland at a college at a bus stop. Um, he asked the black student to move aside. The black student did not move aside, and the black student was stabbed to death. In Portland, Oregon, uh, there was a, an alt right guy who was screaming at a, a young teenage uh, girl in a hijab. Two men stood up to defend her on the light rail, broad daylight. They were stabbed to death. And then came Charlottesville. That's when the world saw the alt-right jump from a phenomenon on, on the internet into real life with their chance of Jews will not replace us, their tiki torches, their melees, and ultimately the death of a counter-protester, Heather Heyer, who was run over by a bigot in a Dodge Charger. Now I am scared. I, I have to confess that this book is somewhat hard on American Jews because I'm wondering where we are, where our voice is in the public, sec in the public square. Elie Wiesel called American Jewry the Jews of silence for failing to speak out for, the Jew for Soviet Jewry. And we were fairly acquiescent, actually, or at least very, uh, very 
cacophonous ahead of the Holocaust. The Jews, kind of, the American Jewish Committee was on one side advocating more quiet diplomacy. The American Jewish Congress, which represented more recent Eastern European rivals, were on a different side. They all converged in Geneva before the war, and uh, actually, if you read press reports, they all talk about Jewish uh, dis discord, that the American Jews could not speak in one voice. And now there was this attitude that with such prominent Americans as Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh espousing anti-Semitism and backing the Nazis, why should we speak out? Why should we actually court the fate of European Jewry? I actually devoted a whole chapter in the book to what I call the, the Israel obsession or the Israel diversion. For decades now, American Jews have had their liberal groups like J Street, the New Israel Fund, have had conservative or mainline groups like APAC and the American Jewish Committee. They argue and argue incessantly. And what do they argue over? They argue over Israel. For 25 years, there was a guy named Ken Stern I talked to. He, came, he worked for the American Jewish Committee, and he finished his tenure there as the director of the Division of Anti-Semitism and Extremism. When he arrived, he told me, the committee had an entire floor in New York devoted to domestic issues like education, immigration, inter-ethnic relations, inter-religious outreach. And over time, those concerns were subordinated to a singular concern, Israel. Clean energy? Okay. But make sure it's about Israel, Israeli energy security. Interfaith efforts? Fine, as long as they're geared toward heading off the, the uh, BDS movement, boycott, di boycott, divest, and sanctions against Israel. Outreach to the Hispanic community? By all means, because, hey, Hispanics are a rising political force, and they need to be kept on the side of Israel. The American Jewish Committee saw where the big money was coming from. Why chase the $5,000 or $10,000 checks when hedge fund managers are cutting checks in six figures or seven figures? But you got to keep it to the to a do, to a common denominator. You got to temper your temper your talk. Don't offend to, don't offend too many people. And the the way to do that was to focus on Israel. Uh, Israel was born of one of the worst atrocities in human history. Certainly, the worst atrocity in Jewish history, the Holocaust. Its existence is a testament to the desire to keep Jews safe. But let me tell you, if the United States becomes a hostile country to Jews, Israel is not safe. It is by far the largest recipient of, Jew of American military aid. Israel's Iron Dome missile shield was built with Israeli ingenuity, but also a lot of American help. Israeli engineers helped design the Joint Strike Fighter, and Israel's Air Force will be the only one in the Middle East that will get this advanced aircraft. But when the plane rolls off the assembly line, it will roll off Lockheed Martin's assembly line in Fort Worth, Texas, not in Tel Aviv. So the fact is that the Jewish haven is only as safe as, as long as it's under the, the American security umbrella. American Jewry should be at least as focused on maintaining political support for Judaism in the United States as it is on sustaining Israel's security. At the height of the 2016 campaign, when the alt-right dog whistling was going crazy, David Harris, the head of the American Jewish Committee, wrote a column for USA Today. And he was happily recounting that Iv Ivanka Trump had converted to Judaism and that Chelsea Clinton had married a guy named Mark Mezvinsky. Oh, joy, he exalted. Whoever wins will bring a Jewish family to the White House. This is exactly what he wrote. How American Jewish voters will respond to Donald Trump's Jewish links and pro-Israel statements and to persistent questions about the support he is receiving from far right, including white supremacists and anti-Semitic groups, remains to be seen. But as if passed as prologue, there are likely to be some Jews both loudly supporting and energetically opposing his candidacy. Welcome to American presidential politics and the Jews, 2016. And welcome to the world of Jewish national leadership where pro-Israel statements and white supremacy can happily coexist in a single sentence that doesn't take any side whatsoever. <laughs> so we really can do better than that. As I was writing this book, 
I had lunch with a rabbi in Washington that you guys, a lot of you might know, Dan, Daniel Zemel, who's the my, Temple Micah's rabbi. And because we were Jewish, we had lunch for three hours. Um, <laughs> and he told me after Trump was elected that uh, Shabbat services at Micah that Friday night were packed. Congregants were shell-shocked. They were looking for support and answers. And that scene repeated itself the weekend after uh, uh, the weekend of Trump's inauguration. Six miles away from Temple Micah, on the evening of December 14th, 2016, the Conference of Presidents of Major, Jewish, Major American Jewish Organizations had gathered for a Hanukkah party co-hosted by the Embassy of Azerbaijan at the Trump Hotel. It's not a secret that Azerbaijan's uh, record of human rights is atrocious, but Azerbaijan does have warm relations with Israel. Morton Klein, the head of the Zionist Organization of America, had blasted the far-left extremists, his words, who were objecting to the site of a Jewish umbrella organization partying in the Lincoln Library of the Trump Hotel with diplomats from Azerbaijan. It would have been terribly unwise, he said, for the conference to have pulled out and say, hey, we don't want to have this in the Trump Hotel. If the Trump people became aware of this, they would have been offended. Offended? This was just a few weeks after the Trump campaign aired its final closing ad, which invade against global special interests as the Jewish faces of Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs and Janet Yellen, the Fed chairwoman, crossed the screen. Forget about dog whistles. These were foghorns. Or as Rabbi Zemel put it, let's face it, the American Jewish community has been abandoned by its leaders. I want to be here and clear about one thing here. I'm not saying that Jewish response to the rise of anti-Semitism and white supremacist bigotry should be a uniform adoption of left-wing politics. I'm not saying that. Some of the most articulate and passionate voices against authoritarianism and our drift away from American institutions have been conservatives, and many of them have been conservative Jews. The defense of American institutions, like such lefty concepts as the US Constitution, the rule of law, law enforcement, American intelligence, should not be considered democratic or Republican endeavors. There are certain lines that neither party should cross, like bigotry and racism and authoritarianism. That's not liberal or conservative, that's American. So in closing, I want to tell you an, an, an obscure story. Bear with me a little bit because this is, I have to go back with this one. Back in 2014, before anyone really had heard of the alt-right, the vicious lads who hang out in the fever swamps of places like 4chan and 8chan and Reddit, they had kind of collectively decided that women, this small group of women video game designers needed to be destroyed. Um, their offense was designing video games that could appeal to women, in which, like, you don't win points for running down prostitutes, you don't win points for gunning down anything. Um, there was actually one for, to deal with depression. Um, so, the, so the lads in the chat rooms decided to attack. And they used all these tricks that the alt-right would eventually adopt in the years to come. They doxed, meaning they would publish the personal information, the addresses, the social security numbers of these women game designers online so people could attack them both in person or attack their bank accounts or their identities. They swatted which is when you actually call the local police station with an address and say, hey, I saw a, a shooter at this address. And then you watch the SWAT team descend on your target. Um, and it's, it's actually extremely dangerous, especially for dogs who come out and bark at the, the, uh, the SWAT team and get shot. In the case of Zoe Quinn, there was a bitter ex-boyfriend, and he compiled uh, something called, he called the Zoe Post, which was a mix of Sexual, express, sexually explicit language, kind of kiss and tell stories about her, uh, innuendos, exaggerations, falsehoods that he put online on 4chan. And the attacks on Zoe Quinn were just horrific. There was uh, her, Wikipedia po her Wikipedia page, which was altered to read, died October 14th, 2014, which was the date of her next public appearance. Social media posts urged her to kill herself. They pictured her covered in semen. And the threats were like, 
If I ever see you or see you are doing a panel in any in, at an event I am going to, I will literally kill you. Or we have to rape Zoe Quinn and take everything from her. We have to ruin her life. What happened to Zoe Quinn was horrific, but it was also important because at that point, most of the racists who were online were living in their own little worlds, like Stormfront or the Daily Stormer. Um, they were talking to each other. But then what they saw the misogynist lads in 4chan were able to do, they said, whoa, we can do that too. That was when they decided to branch out into more public websites like 4chan and 8chan and Reddit and eventually Twitter uh, and, the, and the YouTube discussion rooms. If you ever go to a YouTube discussion room, you, you'd be shocked. So they, they learned to weaponize social media. And I bring this up also for, to make a more uplifting point. Zoe Quinn is an amazing woman. When this happened, she and her boyfriend, who happened to be a yeshiva guy named Alex Lifshitz, um, they started an outfit called Crash Override, which was a support service for the victims of online abuse, for social workers who were dealing with this, for lawyers, and also for security experts. Crash Override kind of taught people how to deal with this. In its first override, in, in, I'm sorry, its first year online, um, in 2015, Zoe Quinn had personally handled a thousand calls. Eventually, she actually had to shut this down because she personally couldn't handle all of this. And what it, what would it mean for somebody like Zoe Quinn and for the countless victims out there, if Jewish wherewithal, if Jewish money and muscle and organizational skills were put behind an effort like that? Why aren't we helping? Why is Zoe Quinn doing this all by herself? In a society where intolerance, hatred, and just plain nastiness are suddenly far more tolerated, anti-Semitism is just one of many horrors. One of many like Islamophobia, attacks on immigrants, on racist, uh, 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 racist attacks, homophobic attacks. We're all in this together. Anti-Semitic hate crimes rose 57% in 2017 over 2016, with the largest single-year jump on record, according to the Anti-Defamation League. It's, this is a brand new compilation. But remember, the 2,000 incidents that were recorded in 2017 were actually on top of another big jump in 2016 uh, during the campaign. Anti-Semitic assaults had risen 34% in 2016, but that was more than matched by the number of assaults on Muslim Americans, which rose 57%. And where Jews were reporting taunts and disruptions, bomb threats, headstones being overturned, Muslim Americans were reporting murders. In 1958, after the Ku Klux Klan bombed a synagogue in Atlanta, my synagogue, um, Ralph McGill, who was then a crusading editor of the Atlanta Constitution, wrote, you cannot preach and encourage hate for the Negro and hope to restrict it to that field. When the wounds of hate are loosed on one people, then no one is safe. The wounds of hate have been unloosed. It's time for us to refocus our gaze homeward, to unite around what it means to be Americans, and defend democratic pluralism. So, I have, we'll take questions now. So, it would be great if you guys, if you have a question, to stand up at one of the microphones on the side, because we are filming this, and then we can hear it. That young man over there. Uh, hello, Jonathan. Hello. Um, is there any evidence of foreign interference in this movement? You know, I, I, a lot of people have asked me if, uh, if a lot of the bots that came out, you know, a lot of the, the anti-Semites that came after me were, were bots, were Russian bots or anything. And I actually went through at the time, there was a, there's a, actually a, a website that called Bot or Not, where you can plug in uh, the, the the Twitter troll and see if it was a bot. And I did a number of them, and they did they come up with like a percentage, seventy percent chance this is not a bot. Um, so I have not heard of that, but I certainly wouldn't put it past them. And I have to say that when Twitter was under massive pressure to start addressing this, they at first they resisted and they resisted and they resisted. The Times put together like a, a compendium of the worst attacks on me and sent them to Twitter and got a message back saying, we don't see any violation of our terms of service here. 
their terms of service, when you, you know, this is not a free speech issue, really. Um, when you sign up for Facebook or for Twitter, you agree to their terms of service. And their terms of service say you will not attack anyone based on their religion, their race, their sexual orientation. And so to say that, first of all, to say that this wasn't a violation of the terms of service was insane. Um, but also to say that somehow cracking down on uh, this kind of hatred uh, was a, a violation of, uh, of free speech is just not right. I mean, Twitter and Facebook are private private message boards. They're companies. So it, 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 it covers a different thing. But I would like to look into that. Uh, there's a problem that uh, it doesn't have to be the fact that I live in Northwest or actually in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and I work for Hillary Clinton, but the world that I came out of and live in now um, has had what we call a very hip anti-Semitism, a, a crust, if you will. Um, it can play a number of different roles. For example, how about this for a laugh? Uh, Ellie Wiesel is my favorite Jewish comedian. That could get, not for me, but I hear that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the problem, by no means the major problem for many of us, and not exclusively of Jews, is that you go along with this. You overlook it, or to be brutally frank, eh, it's the blacks' problem, which has always been the group that's gotten stomped on in the most vicious ways. So it's as if this really isn't our problem, though we should. So... <clears throat> Thanks. I actually agree that this notion that, like, you could just say, well, hey, Muslims are being attacked. Hey, let, you know, Latino immigrants are being, you know, wrenched out of their, their houses of their houses or their workplaces. But it's not our problem. I mean, the fact is, as, as, as Ralph McGill said, you cannot think that hate on one group is going to be confined to that group, and it's, it's not. And I think that you're right. We have been extremely tolerant of these things, and it's time to ha have a little intolerance. Yes. Uh, hi. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I actually uh, know your mom. I work with her. I work at J Street, and I've um, gotten to know her in Atlanta in some of my work, so she's great. Um, <laughs> I... Although I, I think that she falls into the category of argues about Israel too much. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I wanted to uh, slight. well, on the one hand, A, really lift up something you said. I also had been involved in AJC and actually had a meltdown when I saw that um, uh, op-ed that David Harris wrote and actually emailed the board that I was on at the time out of like complete pulling out my hair uh, mm -hmm. frustration and ended up in part stopping my involvement because of their reaction to Trump. And I felt like a lot of the Jewish community was hiding behind their 501c3 status as a way of saying that's why we're not going to comment on certain things. Um, personally, working at J Street, I want to push back and say, while I agree, even though I work at J Street, we speak too much about Israel. On the other hand, our own organization had a you know similar crisis right after the you know, crisis of conscience right after the election. And we as an organization decided to speak about uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and, you know, uh, Im immigrant immigrants and their humanity um, in response to Trump's um, election. And I do feel that the the one of the major issues within the Jewish community is the territoriality and the unwillingness to constantly, to join together in coalition because, you know, I don't like your group or your group and we don't work together in, you know, decades of histories between different CEOs. So just as a aside, there are many Jewish organizations that are, you know, in coalition working with Muslims. We're going to speak against Pompeo for his Islamophobia and um, but we all need to do better. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know it's it is interesting because a lot of organizations like a lot of or, uh, mainline organizations like the American Jewish Committee weren't invented for to deal with Israel because obviously Israel didn't exist when the American Jewish Committee was started. J Street was basically invented to deal with Israel <laughs> um, from the, from the le from the left. But if if you guys are now branching off into looking at at uh, the domestic situation, more power to you. Yes, sir. 
How do you choose to interpret Trump's establishing the American embassy in Jerusalem? I'm glad you asked that question because there is, during, during the campaign and since the campaign, there has been a, there have been a certain group of uh, American Jews who have been so happy with Trump's policies toward Israel that other policies have been completely overlooked. Um, so, hey, it's okay that he said, nah, there are fine people on both sides in, in Char Charlottesville because, hey, he moved the, he moved the embassy to, to Jerusalem. Um, this has been a recurring theme, like with some of the largest, uh, some of the largest Jewish donors, Sheldon Adelson, Bernie Marcus down in Atlanta, who was the co-founder of, uh, of um, uh, Home Depot, that there, there's been a, a tendency to silence dissent because, hey, this is the most pro-Israel president we've ever had. And this is kind of the division in, in the Jewish community, I, I talk about this in my book, between the tribalists and the internationalists. The tribalists, they're inward looking and they care most about Israel because that's the tribe. The internationalists see the Jew as a, a part of a larger world and that throughout history, when nationalism has, aris has risen, um, it is generally not very good for, <laughs> for Judaism. Uh, Jews have suffered, have suffered most when nationalism rises. And right now, we have had you know, 100,000 proto-fascists marching in Budapest. We, ha we just had a, uh, a white nationalist movement get a plurality of seats in the parliament in Rome. Um, we have the Polish government just passed a law that says it's illegal to even s insinuate that Poles had anything to do with the Holocaust. The movement on the, the nationalist right is an international powerful trend. And now the movement to the, the move of our embassy really is not a way to counter that. That's what I would say. Yes, sir. I think it's okay to criticize Israel. I criticize Israel, but when does criticism of Israel become anti-Semitic? And I, why is Israel, I, I go to progressive groups and they're liberal, but Israel always comes up, mm -hmm. even when it, it's, I remember one on criminal justice and Israel came up. Right. I, I, the question was, does, well, one of the questions is, why does Israel come up all the time? It always amazes me, too. Like, whatever conversation, somehow it goes to Israel. I don't know. I, I really don't get that. Like, it's, it's always right below the surface. It's very odd. Um, is that I think, But I do think, I do, look, obviously when anti-Zionist marches in Paris and London eventually degenerate to to shouts of death to the Jews, well. then, uh, an, then anti-Zionism has degenerated into anti-Semitism. But I will also say this. Um, I'm always asked, wherever I go, asked about the, what about the anti-Semitism on the left? And I'm not dismissive of a Louis Farrakhan whose version of anti-Semitism is just gutter bigotry. But I will also say that there is a, gener a younger generation of, of, um, of college students, high school students, Americans, and Jews who really, really do not like Israel. They grew up, you know, it used to be that you'd say, well, the Israeli government isn't Israel, and I understand that. But they grew up um, with, with the Likud policies, uh, which were so in have been so entrenched for so long. And I, I always talk about my, my stepdaughter, uh, Hannah Wyatt, who is really, really anti-Israel. And you can call her an anti-Semite. She was bat mitzvahed. She really identifies with Judaism. She loves her Judaism. But if you call her an anti-Semite, it will do you no good. It will not change her views. It will not engage her in any way. If you want to engage her in... Israel and Israeli politics and why Israel should exist, you have to engage her on the field of policy. Because if you just call her an anti-Semite, she'll just laugh at you. She's not a, she's, she is so proudly identified as Jewish. So I, I, would, I would distinguish between like college students who have embraced the BDS movement and a Louis Farrakhan or, uh, or those chants of death to Jews uh, that you hear in Europe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I have been reading a lot recently about what you mentioned, are, are Jews white? Um, and that a fear of the alt-right is that, despite what the alt-right says, you can't often look at someone who's Jewish and know, and know that they're Jewish, unlike, you know, you look at a black person and you know generally they're black. But I was struck by what you said, that no one knows how observant you are, but your name gives you away. And I'm, I am struggling with, um, especially as I, sorry about the distraction, but start to raise a Jewish child, how do you think you can be Jewish in America in this day and age when Jewishness is thrust upon you rather than something that you necessarily choose to identify as? And you it's know, not something it's I a, ever thought about growing up. So It's an interesting question because I, you know, I, felt, I have felt much more Jewish uh, since being attacked as Jewish. You know, there was that notion during, during the Nazi era that, you know, you can run from your Judaism, but they'll come and find, your, find you anyway. Um, and uh, so I would, I, I was, during, during the onslaught, I used to get pictures of me in various places, always with a, with a big black felt hat and paeuses. Um, and I, I don't know if that's what they thought I was, like, or if they just thought, hey, it'd be fun to, uh, fun to uh, have Jonathan Weissman as, a, as an Orthodox, or as a you know, Lubavitcher Jew. Um, I feel like, actually, this is a time to embrace your Jewish identity, because if you don't, uh, it's just going to be embraced for you. And it, it's a time to, I, to, um, to define Judaism the way you want it to be, so somebody else isn't defining it for you. Because yes, they act, the, the, the white nationalists do not believe that Jews are white. Um, it's, it's this odd concoction of what, what, it makes you wonder what is race? Race obviously is not appearance at all. I mean, I would not call myself <coughs> anything but white, but they would never call me white. Um, white is something else. So uh, I, I might as well just say, okay, I'm Jewish, all right. Yes. I first want to thank you for um, writing this book and addressing this full force. And, and I heard the Fresh Air interview with Terry Gross. And so I was looking forward to tonight. And I actually changed my reaction. I've got the book and I will read it. Um, but I want to make a few points. I've had not a horrendous share of anti-Semitic events in my life. But since hearing you in the last few days, I thought of two worth mentioning. Um, a coworker, uh, this was reported by another Jewish coworker that in the ladies' room when she heard a million children had been killed in the Holocaust, this woman said, well, they must have done something wrong. And another woman at work when I was homesick and she was on the front desk and I called in for some reason said to me, referred to me as a so-called Jew. Which what did she mean by that? Uh, well, she was uh, Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm not really sure, but it it's almost reminds me of the, you know, the quote. I mean, I just chose not to go back to it with her, for sure, yeah. but it was shocking. Anything so-called is always a dismissal. So-called peace activist, so-called, it's it ratifies when it's written about, even in Jewish papers. They say so-called peace groups, mm -hmm. which I find really offensive. So, a little extra tangent. So, I was... At, in front of the Trump Hotel with young demonstrators the night of that Hanukkah party. Um, I thought it was horrendous. There were groups that, that I had been in, AJ Congress, many years ago that I couldn't imagine the, the, the leaders of that group being in there now. No way. And, and Mort Klein, people should know anything they read of his, he's as extreme on the right wing of Jewish life as can ever be. A mm -hmm. Zionist organization of America, very active, writes a lot of nasty letters. Um, so, in the last few months, people, I, I, what I disagree with you about is, and I just want to give a few examples: Bend the Ark, Teruwa, J Street, Peace Now, um, Jews that are involved in, in so many demonstrate. We are so busy and overwhelmed, we are at demonstrations for DACA people. Jewish groups got arrested recently. We are, um, we are in the streets against hatred against Muslims, against Black Lives uh, Matter, or not against, for Black Lives Matter. I, and 
if anything, we're overwhelmed and we're spread far too thin. I've lost count of the times I've run down to the White House, and it's been more for others. And I've right. been, the one thing I thought of saying to you before tonight was, I'm, the things that have me not sleeping at night really are worry about my friends, my friend who's dressed in all black in hijab, who's an incredibly dear friend, who's now afraid. She conveyed right. it without saying the words afraid. I, um, I fear for the children that worry about their mothers being taken out of the country tomorrow. And Okay, I'm not meaning to cut you off. It's just uh, There's a lot of people that have questions. So, oh. <laughs> I, so, so, let me just, so I mean, we're out there. So let me just say, I, I know that, and I, I talk to, I, I quote the uh, Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism in this book. I know that there are, I talk about, these uh, sm uh, these city level groups like NOAA in Nashville, these organizations of these interreligious organizations that are doing wonderful work, and I agree. I'm my criticism is really for the for those huge organizations in glass edifices in New York that uh, don't seem to actually want to take to the streets. So I I got you. Hi, um, I have two questions. One, um, what do you think happens when Trump is defeated or uh, impeached, and the second, like, are things okay? What you know? What do we go back <laughs> to things being okay? Um, and yeah, I just lost my. I, I can't. You know, I, I talk about. I, I don't. I, you know, I'm not. I don't want to get into like real base politics here, but I do want to talk about. I do talk in this book about movements, and I mean trends, and in the United States. Now, we had this notion basically since the 50s and 60s that the United States has been on this, tra this unstoppable trajectory toward inclusive pluralism. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of hit its apotheosis in 2008 when the economy had collapsed, when the, uh, when, when the whole financial system, and if you remember back, there was a sense that, oh my gosh, capitalism itself is collapsing. And then, instead of hordes of uh, fascists in the streets, we elected our first black president, and everybody said, wow, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Like with the, 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 the inevitable trajectory toward inclusion and pluralism is going to continue. And then, suddenly, it didn't. So I can't, at this point in history, I can't say whether we're going to look back in time and think that movement from the 60s into the 2000s was, a, was, a, 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 was an aberration. And in fact, we're now move, sliding backward and we'll just go back, we'll move back and forth between nationalism and internationalism, inclusivity and exclusivity, or... Uh, if we will look back at this moment and say this is the aberration and we're just going to begin that trajectory again. I don't know. I actually have no idea. But I think that we're at this important inflection moment where we have to decide that. I think, I actually think, you know, politicians always say this election is the most important election in history and blah, blah, blah. I actually think the 2014, I mean, sorry, the 2018 election is such an incredible, incredibly important election. I mean, I, I can't imagine a moment where we really have decided in this country which direction we're going to go, um, where the choices are really right in front of us. And I'm very excited to, to, be, to be part of it as, a, as an editor at the New York Times. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I know that a lot of the trolls that have targeted you and other journalists obviously hide behind their avatars. Have you been able to get a sense of what motivates them? I mean, do they have any shared sort of characteristics besides the presumably obvious that they're white men? I, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there are other <laughs> shared characteristics that you are aware of. And then um, when you talked about the 4chan example, you kind of alluded to the fact that there are solutions to the trolling problem. Um, can you speak a little bit more about those and maybe what people have done to support you and others and what everyone in this room could do to support you and others? I think, um, I mean, who are these guys? When, actually, I, I have to say, the Anti-Defamation League did a big study on the attacks on Jewish journalists. And they, and they, it was a really masterful job. And they uncovered a lot of the origins, 
like how organized it was. That's what so was was so striking, how organized it was. And it was really by it was by Andrew Anglin was kind of the the ringleader. He is the one that has has kind of whipped uh, up this army of trolls together. Um, and then there's this other guy, Andrew Auernheimer, I think is how you pronounce it, who is this weird hacker um, who also works with Andrew Anglin and together, and they, they, they have done this remarkable job organizing these things. They are the, they aren't, I don't think the ones that, that wrote, the, wrote the software uh, for, for, the, uh, for the, the trolling, but they're really good at what they do. I mean, there was at one point where Andrew Arnheimer actually commandeered dozens of fax machines all around the country at universities and started faxing out these these neo-Nazi pamphlets, and so they sort of fall, oh, like dropping out of fax machines at universities, and people said, "Oh my gosh, there are Nazis all over the all over the place." Actually, there's one guy who did that. I mean, that's I don't even I couldn't even begin to know how to do that, what he did. Um, so there is there. I mean, I can't I can't say who they are except that they are yes, usually men, white men in their twenties. But you know, in Charlottesville, we got a good glimpse of them. Right, that was their first look. And what can be done? Well. I do. I first of all, I do think that the the um, social media organizations have done a better job of looking. And the fact is that the reason that Facebook was better than Twitter at it was that Facebook actually hires people, actual human beings, to go scour the their their chat rooms and whatever, and actually look look for suspicious things rather than just use software to scan. Um, Twitter then Twitter's under massive pressure started started getting better and they really are I and mean, when they started clearing out they just kind of announced we're clearing out the nazis and now and it's it's interesting if you go onto the daily stormer website which is harder and harder to find because um all of the hosts decided they weren't going to host it so uh but you but it po- it keeps popping up i mean i keep finding it i if 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 the fbi ever looked at my um internet history they would be really appalled um but uh they 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 now andrew england kind of coaches them into okay you can express your anti-semitism but don't attack individually or they're now code words instead of kike it's like skype no let's say you skype well and that person might not know in the world what in the world you're talking about but they all know what in the world you're talking about so they're they're fine they find ways around it to to temper it but um i i don't i don't know i i i'll have to think about what more can be done but i do think what zoe quinn has done with with uh crash override is something that can be emulated i mean one of the things that she's she has personally done. I mean, she and her boyfriend did this on their own. They would call, uh, like, if somebody called and said, "Oh my gosh, I'm being attacked," they would go and call the local police station and say, "Listen, if you get a phone call that says there's an active shooter, uh, like, uh, at this uh, at this house, we know you have to go out. But I'm telling you right now, it's a prank call. So please be careful. I mean, like, that's the simplest thing." But it, it, it worked. Um, I mean, just, just to head off things. But as I said, she couldn't handle... It, it became so big, and most people don't know Crash Override exists. If you had a more organized effort and a more organized website um, where you knew where to go, uh, I think that would be amazing. That, that would be a really powerful thing. Yes. Okay. Thank you for being here. I uh, wanted to go back to what you were talking about earlier with those big legacy organizations and the glass buildings in New York. Where do you see that going going forward, considering that uh, you have organizations that are at some point going to turn over in terms of the generational leadership? Mm-hmm. And these are organizations where young leadership is still considered under 50. All right, right. And sort of where does that go in the next 20, 30 years in terms of their uh, mindset? That's a great question because I'll tell you, since my – actually, it's kind of it's funny. It's not since the book was published. Since a, a, a very short excerpt of the book was published in the Sunday Review uh, last weekend, the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Federations have really come after me. <laughs> and they kind of have kind of proved my point, like, which I, my point was Jews sit around and fight each other all the time. Um, and they – like, I, I, I actually – a friend of mine – 
sent me a sent me a copy of a, a of an email that that the, David Harris, the head of the American Jewish Committee, had sent to the leadership of the American Jewish Committee denouncing me. It's like, oh come on. Um, uh, so uh, so far, their response has not I, has not been particularly constructive. But I do agree that a younger gener I mean, my fear my fear is that a younger generation of Jews will just grow up and just leave Judaism or just drift away. That, that Jewish identity will just not, will be something that lingers in the back of their mind and that's it. Um, they, won't, they won't even think about something like Hadassah or the American Jewish Committee or the Jewish Federations. That's just not going to be them. So what, what does it mean for, the, for this younger generation to come in and take over those glass towers? I w I'm not terribly optimistic that would even happen. I, I would more hope that maybe they'll get involved with J Street or get involved with the New Israel Fund or get involved with Bend the Ark or some of these smaller organizations that are more at the ground level because I, I kind of feel like the future of these those glass edifices is, is fairly bleak. Yes. Hi there. Thank you for speaking. Big fan. Um, so... A number of uh, individuals mentioned the idea of sort of continuing this and trying to, to keep this going. And I think in an era in which, you know, anti-Semitism is, is prominent, it's very easy to bring Jewish individuals together. Um, but you mentioned the sort of overarguing of Israel, which from the bit of history I've read seems to have been in, in I guess, your generation, the generation before, the thing that, that connected Jews, that united Jews, that gave them sort of a positive identity. Um, so would you, pr what, if anything, would you propose as a as a sense of, of positive identity that, that Jews can can turn to moving forward so that it's not just the identity of helping others fighting anti-Semitism if we hopefully get to a point where that passes again, something that will keep identity, keep us united for it? That's a, a, a good question because I, and, and I wish I had the statistics that's in the book about there's a, a recent survey of Jews and uh, asking one of the major polling organizations asked Jews what they what made them Jews, and the 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 answers were like, I though I think the most common one was remembering the Holocaust. And I think the second most common one was affinity for Israel, and I think the third most common one was having a sense of humor. And I, I think like I I think I was like eleven percent of Jews said. Jewish, like Jewish religion, uh, or it was Jewish spirituality, or Jewish law. I mean, it's it was it was disheartening to to be honest. And I do think that I think you're right. I think that Israel has been so much the the glue that held Jewish identity together that we're really at risk with the younger generation that doesn't particularly. You know, I used to tell my mother. I said, "Look, I care about Israel." I care about. I also care about like Sudan. You know, I care about. I care about a lot of countries. I mean, uh, and and she gets really angry when I say that. Um, <laughs> and I think that. And I'm old. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that other uh, uh, that other younger people would say the same. Would say the same thing. Yeah, sure, I care about Israel, but there's the big wide world around us. Um, so I I actually I actually came to the conclusion in this book that. Jews need to actually look inward at their own spirituality. I mean, I, had, I, I talk about how, you know, I, I wrestled with how Jews should confront white nationalism. And I talked to one rabbi who said, you know, we should really ignore them. They only just want attention. And if we just ignore them, they'll go away. And it wasn't, that wasn't a trivial answer. I think it was actually, you know, that is a reasonable, a reasonable response. And I remember talking to a rabbi in uh, Whitefish, Montana. I don't know if you guys know about Whitefish, Montana. Whitefish, Montana was a, is a small Jew, has a small Jewish community at the base of Glacier National Park. And because Richard Spencer, one of the neo-Nazi leaders, Richard Spencer's mother lived there, and there's weird, weird, I mean, kind of quasi-rumor, quasi-truth story about this Jewish... A uh, real estate agent who suggested that she leave town or actually sell her sell her property. This became a big cause celebrity, and the and the alt right decided on that they were going to destroy the entire Jewish community in Greater Whitefish, 
which is about 200 people. But they attacked every one of them. I mean, and they actually said they were going to go kill them all. Uh, it was actually really a, a, a very frightening incident. And I talked to Rabbi Rostin, who was the rabbi of that, of that community, and she said, you know, look, I, I, I feel like right now we don't, we didn't, for a time, we didn't want any attention. We thought the best answer was to ignore it and then try to let it simmer down and then rise up. She called it like the rope-a-dope effect, like you know, what Muhammad Ali used to do. Play dead until, you can, until you, they've worn themselves out and then punch them in the face, which is what they're doing now. They're now trying to put Andrew, bankrupt Andrew Anglin with lawsuits. and they seem to be, It seems to be working, actually. Um, but then I, talked to, and then I talked to Rabbi Zemel, and I put this to him. Do we hide? Do we ignore? Do we fight back? And he said, look at the Torah. The Torah says, where there is, where there is uh, injustice, the Jew must stand up to the injustice. And it, w what struck me is how stupid I am, like, that I didn't even think that there were teachings in my religion that would give answers. And I actually, it was a kind of a revelation, like, yeah, I actually am part of a religion, not just, you know, the people who used to go to Woody Allen movies. Um, and uh, not anymore. But anyway, um, so, I, so I, th I actually think that perhaps what should unite Judaism, I mean, Jews, is Judaism. Okay, last question. And I think that is the answer, and I think you must stand up to injustice, and you need to be preaching that, teaching that, talking that wherever you go. Uh, I rise as an African-American and a descendant of people who were enslaved in Virginia on both maternal and paternal side. So I come with a different perspective. And I came tonight to learn, and I am a frequent visitor at Washington Hebrew Congregation. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with it, oh, yeah. uh, please <laughs> do so, because they are doing great work mm -hmm. in terms of coalition building and rising up to uh, in injustice. Uh, I, I, I would just say real quickly, I actually think that the, that the Jewish community at the synagogue level and the rabbis are doing great things. I think that they are. So now, my question on. to you is, uh, and certainly thank you for your work, because I came tonight to learn, and I have learned uh, from you. I don't know how hopeful you're leaving me, uh, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, you mentioned that you would only define yourself as, as white. Tell me what that means to you and what, uh, what, what is being white. Well, I, I didn't mean that in a kind of a... I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I just, I look at my skin and I can't believe that they say I'm not white, but I just, because I, you know. Well, I'm not pale. white and look at but, my right, skin right. and many times but I you're get right. mistaken look, obviously, for other. You know what, I used to live in Africa and you go to Africa and you go True. see different gradations right. of people. And That's you think, right. You, as Call you, it, if you live in Africa, you actually start thinking the absurdity of race because. Yes, it is absurd. There's like. I mean, so what is somebody from South Sudan compared to North Sudan? What mm -hmm. is what is a, a Nubian compared to a you know a, a, an Ethiopian? I mean, it's it's actually crazy. I mean, actually, I, I had a I had an uncle, and he recently died, and he was the most wonderful man, and he was he was Iranian, uh, an Iranian Jew, and he talks about in the seventies he had this long hair, he was ridiculous looking, and he was hitching across the country, and he he uh, he talked about a policeman pulling up, I was like in Arizona or somewhere, and he said, what are you? And he said, what do you mean? And he says, what are you? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. What, what are you? And he said, I, I white? He said, you ain't white. You know, it's like, I, we don't know. I mean, it's, it is it's absurd. So I didn't mean that, that in any way. Well, I, just, <laughs> just think about it. Now, I'm African-American. I've never, ever wanted to be anything else. Although uh, many times all through school and elsewhere, people wanted me to be something else, I felt. But absolutely not. And uh, I do rise and I do fight injustice and anti-Semitism and it's the way I was raised wherever I go and wherever I am you know and the same thing with uh, racism uh, but uh, I like thinking of you as Jewish and as a Jew and not as white. Thank you. Okay. All right. Should we get one more? All right, the last one. Um, I'll do it quick. Hello. I grew up, I'm glad to be here. I came here because of the Terry Gross interview also. Um, I was born in 1945, and the talk that Jewish moms did to me was pointing out which apartment buildings would not rent to them. Mm -hmm. 
and which stores would ignore you or be rude. And so I'm, when I had the pleasure or delusion of the period in which I grew up, and this arc toward justice and brotherhood, and it was on the public, address, the public service announcements on television about loving all your neighbors. And I used to say, what will I live to see? And um, how do you sustain being tolerant to someone who isn't? And I went to the public libraries and heard the little girls in their Catholic uniforms say, oh, well, gee, I don't know. I don't believe all Jews can be bad. And so when we're talking about what did it mean, it meant, well, I chose to ignore my mother. So when she said, don't have any friends who aren't Jews, you can't trust them. And I learned that I didn't want, I, I managed to have a life where that was old fashioned. And here I say, well, I grow, have a growing list of things that my country has decided they will not protect me because of. And so it's not any, you know, it's way before Israel. <laughs> it's way before the memory of a lot of people who are here. Well, as a, and as I a, don't want to, I mean, I don't want to be a diatribe, but for the humor to just say, I'm getting to find out what I'm living to see. Well, there we go. But, but as I said, I mean, look, I, I actually believe that this country as a, an accepting pluralist uh, democracy has made great strides since 1945. So now we have to decide where we're going from here. Um, my advice to you is to recognize that Jews argue because it's mandated. Okay. <laughs> it's how we attack our wisdom tradition. Okay. So go for it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.